Good evening. Welcome to our December virtual parlor chat. My name is Catherine Hughes, and I am the executive director of the Morris Jamel Mansion in Manhattan. It is the oldest surviving residence in the island of Manhattan. And uh, we are very excited tonight to be able to have Tracy Telasco um, join us and talk about the installations that she's put into the mansion um, and really taken a critical look at our history. And I think it's a great combination of art and history. So uh, we're very, very happy to have Tracy with us. Um, now to this evening's format uh, will include Tracy doing a presentation. I'm gonna introduce Tracy and give a little background on the exhibition that she's created. Um, and then we're going to have a discussion and that will follow Tracy's uh, presentation. So please do feel free to uh, put your questions or comments in the Q&A. Um, we have Presley Rodriguez on uh, as our tech tonight. And so Presley uh, is reading all of those and keeping up. So um, we are uh, now gonna begin officially um, uh, so that I can introduce Tracy. Uh, she creates installations that use architecture as a social and political space addressing identity and power imbalances. Fragmented walls, floors, and interior spaces are stripped of their intended function in, in, uh, in absurd ways. She often uses multiples of everyday objects and construction material working with their inherent associations. Telasco's work has been included in exhibitions nationally and internationally. Her most notable solo installations are Rub Me the Wrong, Rub Me the Wrong Way at the Brooklyn Arts Council Gallery, uh, plus Dumbo Arts Festival, How You Seduce Me, brought to you by Glidden at Arts, Art Space New Haven. And this is uh, a number that I don't know that I can say off the top of my head, Tracy. What is the number of acres? 0. 0.00918 acres. Okay. <laughs> um, and that was at the McGrath Galleries uh, in New York City. Uh, so the exhibition that she has created at the Morris Jamel Mansion is called Revise, Revised Histories. And this includes site-specific installations throughout the museum. The Act of Removal series recreates architectural sections of the mansion out of carved erasers in five different locations. Connecting to the history of its former residents, the artist calls attention to the details that have been purposefully left out and that have been changed over time through the retelling and or uncovering of new facts. The use of erasers as a material conceptually and poetically represents the removal of information, both through erasing and carving. On a use, universal level, this exhibition investigates the retelling of history and the information that is lost or missing in the process. The implied action of erasing speaks of mistakes and inaccuracies and of history itself. An installation in the basement looks at the house through a decolonist lens. Telasco has constructed a partial house foundation out of cinder blocks made from bars of ivory soap, titled 99.44% pure and other white lies. So I wanna welcome Tracy to this chat and invite her to share her process and her, uh, her thoughts about what she has created at the Morris Jamel Mansion. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you so much, Catherine. Welcome everyone. I appreciate you joining tonight. 
Um, I'm going to just share my screen so I can show you some images and we can do a walkthrough of the exhibition. For those of you that have not seen the Morris Jamel Mansion, this is what it looks like from the outside. So I have actually been working on this project for almost two years now. And just to give you a little background into how it came about, uh, I am attracted to different everyday materials. And I knew that I was really interested in working with erasers as a medium, but I needed to find a location that made sense. And I started researching historic houses and locations and came upon the Morris Jamel Mansion. It's the oldest residence in Manhattan, as I believe Catherine had mentioned. And I was invited to do a site visit. I developed a proposal and I spent a few months developing ideas and doing research. And I was mainly focused on the histories within the house that had changed over time, as well as parts of the house that were recreated from primary source documents. And I also applied for funding along with the Morris Jamel Mansion, and we received uh, an individual artist grant from NISCA to support the project. So just to give you a little bit of background, it's been uh, you know, a very long, a long process, but that's a little bit of the insight into the beginnings of the project itself. And I'm going to give you, when, when you walk into the mansion, this is one of the first pieces that you see in the entry hallway. And this piece uh, is called the act of removal. All of the eraser, there's five eraser pieces, and all of them are called the act of removal. And then they're titled also with a location. Uh, for this one, I was interested in uh, the way that information has been left out of history. This was for this particular wallpaper pattern. It was created from a description in a letter from Eliza Jamel, who was one of the residents in the house to her husband. And so what I thought was really interesting in choosing this location is that uh, the way that historians uh, piece together information. So there was no visual of the wallpaper pattern. It was a description in a letter and then uh, someone recreated it. And then I carved this fragment of erasers from the, uh, from the wallpaper pattern. And so I was thinking a bit about how information is translated. And throughout the museum, you're gonna see in each one of these pieces, they are carved in slightly different ways. For this one, there are some sections that are missing. You can see part of the columns start to uh, fade away. There's the marble pattern. They're, they're meant to be these remnants or these fragments. So the, um, you know, the edges are, are curved and they're almost like these uh, little sections that are inserted into the architecture. And so I was thinking about information that fades that gets lost, that's erased over time. Um, and what was interesting, oh, here you can see a detail, which is the, the face and some of the, the little details in the carving for this particular piece. Um, the next piece that you see when you enter the museum are these giant wings. Um, so there's actually three objects, three of these wings in the house. Uh, the one that I carved that you see here is the largest of them. It's about seven feet long. And behind it, you can see a smaller one. There's also one in front of it. So you sort of see these three, uh, you know, in a row. And these wings have a very interesting story because there is an oral history in which Eliza Jamel um, told this story saying that they were a gift from Napoleon. And later it was proved that uh, that was inaccurate. And they found a receipt from an auction and they were purchased at an estate sale. Uh, so it, it's interesting that it was, I don't wanna say it was completely fabricated because they do think it was from that same time period and there is something else in the house from Napoleon. But I thought it was really comical 
that for such a long time, there was this story and this history about the fact that these wings were from Napoleon and it was just uh, completely fabricated. So I was thinking a lot about, um, you know, these inaccuracies can fade throughout history also today, but just, I guess, the, the humor in that and the absurdity and, you know, erasers themselves are pretty absurd material, but also a playful material. And I think I liked thinking about, you know, history itself. I felt erasers really kind of were the perfect material to talk about history because it's this erasing of mistakes and the carving is this removal of information. And with this piece, you can see that the wings themselves are actually uh, three-dimensional. They're built up into different layers. Uh, there are these eagle wings, there's this quiver and these arrows in the center. Um, it's a pretty elaborate piece. This one took a very, very long time, very long time to create. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about the process after I kind of walk you through all of the different pieces. Uh, here's a detail. So you can see um, some of the individual erasers. So throughout the entire show, there's actually about 8,000 erasers that are through, used for the different pieces. And I didn't want them to be you know, one solid piece or one cast eraser. I really liked the individual nature um, of the erasers sort of coming together, these bits and pieces, thinking about them almost as these bits and pieces of information or these bits and pieces of history. And these are about, you know, one inch by two inch pink erasers that you might think of as, you know, school erasers. Um, they have a little bit of a scent to them. They remind me of, you know, being in school. And, uh, you know, so all of those different associations, the, the bright pink color. Um, so those were some things that I was thinking about. And once you get inside, when you go through the archway, <clears throat> there's this piece um, with the cloud wallpaper pattern. Now, this was another one that was from a description in a letter. And I liked this connection between the wings and the flying and the sky and the clouds. And also just thinking about these different associations that the feathers and the wings and the arrow and the quivers have. Um, so kind of the, the play between these two different um, locations and the, you know, the sky and the wings together. And I have another one here where you can see more of a detail with this one. So um, for this particular piece, the clouds become the three-dimensional part, the relief part that stands out and then the sky has been carved away. So I was just playing with these different ways that the, the carving took place, the different, uh, different techniques with carving them. And <clears throat> I also was thinking a little bit about um, with this one, like I said, the, the sky, the clouds and the connection with the, with the wings and the other piece. Um, in the same room, there is a, a carpet pattern. What, what I loved about this is here's a painting that's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And it's really fascinating because the carpet for the room, for the octagon room here, I'm gonna show you, and then I'm gonna go back for a second. So this carpet was created based on this painting that's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So I think of this piece almost as uh, a game of telephone <laughs> where, you know, you whisper something to someone and then they pass it on and then they pass it on. And uh, I loved that historians looked at this painting, had someone, I think it was in, a fabricator in Europe. I can't remember if this was Paris trying to remember, but uh, maybe Catherine knows that information. We can ask her at the end, but do it, you know was, it was, it was indeed Paris. Paris. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I got it right. <laughs> I was trying to remember. Um, but I love that, you know, based on this, then fabricators created this carpet pattern. And then I 
carved a section of it out of the erasers. So it's sort of, you know, how, how many times can information be removed and translated? And with this particular piece, it's carved the opposite way. Instead of the floral pattern being a relief and standing up out of the carpet, it's actually carved in to the erasers in the opposite way as a, you know, as a negative space. Um, I was thinking about the way information is interpreted and translated in different ways in different periods of time. And I liked this idea of having all of the pieces be carved in a slightly different way. What I loved about this one, it was so much fun <laughs> and so detailed with the texture of the carpet and the stripes and the little lace doily. In this one, you can also see that some of the erasers are different pinks. And even though I was using the same brand of erasers, I found it interesting because some of the different boxes, you know, again, I had 8,000 erasers <laughs> and some of the boxes, they actually were different color pinks and it was very subtle. I don't think I would have ever picked up on it except for the fact that I had so many of them together. And so with this one, I kind of mixed some of the different pinks together in one piece because I, I thought it felt more, you know, more like the material of the carpet and added some more visual texture to the piece. Um, then the last of the eraser pieces is actually upstairs on the second floor. And this is in uh, Eliza Jamel's bed chamber. And for this piece, I was really, so Eliza was, you know, sort of the woman of the house. And much of the history in the museum comes from an oral history from Eliza. And I think for a very long time, historians have worked to, you know, uncover what was true, what was not true um, from what, from Eliza's stories. Um, there were a lot of, uh, missing facts or things that um, inaccuracies that were are being investigated at different points in time. And I think, you know, they're trying to have a fuller understanding of who Eliza Jamel was. Um, with this one, the wallpaper pattern on the mantle, I, this one is a much deeper relief pattern you can see in the carving of the flowers and of the wreath, the wreaths that go around. And I really liked this thinking about it. Again, they're all sort of meant to be these remnants and these and these fragments, but this one is more of, you know, a shorter long piece that goes across the mantle. And it's also viewed from further away into the room. Here you can see a close up in some of the patterns and the way that they're that they're carved away. Okay, um, then in the basement. So this actually is a project that began, I would say, as an investigation uh, with my own identity as a white female, but also an investigation into the word white and language. Uh, titles and language are really important in my work. And I think I was really bothered by the fact that white uh, always has these good connotations. Uh, it talks about purity. If, if you think about different versions of white, there's lily white, um, even white, you know, white lies. Uh, but white lies are the, the good kind of lies. And I really liked Ivory Soap, Ivory Soap's marketing, right? They sell it as 99.44% pure. Uh, I added in the other, like, other white lies part along with the title. But I was really thinking about these different definitions within society and these systemic structures. So the bars of Ivory Soap are constructed into these cinder blocks. Each one of these has, I think it's 74 bars of soap. They're rather heavy. They're about uh, 16 pounds a piece. And they're just put together with 
tile adhesive and with grout. And so in building these cinder blocks, you know, I'm talking about these systemic structures within our society, these systems that need to be dismantled and worn away and using uh, Ivory's own marketing campaign as a way to talk about this. Again, there is this level of absurdity in the material, but there's also this implied action of this wearing away, of this washing away. And you can see that some of the bars of soap, I, I pre-weathered them, um, I soaked them in water, they change over time, they yellow over time, which I thought was a very ironic and funny, funny, um, absurd thing that would happen because, you know, we're talking about being white and being pure and they're, they're changing color, they're yellowing, they're cracking. So you can see some other use here. You can see the difference in the color as the soap changes over time. And this is really meant to be something, you know, to, um, to spark conversation, to spark dialogue within the community and to have people, um, you know, really think about the harmful nature of white privilege uh, and how important it is for us to sort of dismantle and pull apart these systems. The other thing, the location of this space in the basement, this is this was a uh, a kitchen, and we know historians know that there were four enslaved people at the Morris Jamal Mansion, and they are working right now to uncover uncover stories and more information about who these individuals were. I know it's a uh, a bigger initiative that they're working on at the museum. So I felt that this piece made sense in the basement. I also wanted it to be, you know, this partial house foundation, thinking about it as this structure, this piece that, um, you know, the structure that needs to come apart and be dismantled. And it's also um, what's, what's interesting about this space is because it's such an old house and it's a basement, <laughs> um, the walls itself, have, um, you know, they have some water damage, they're crumbling, they're peeling, and it just kind of makes sense in the space. You can see on the right, the molding is kind of being pulled apart. Um, and there's, you know, the soap that's cracking. So it's, it's mimicking in a way, a lot of what is even happening with the walls and the, and the space itself. These are just some other views. Okay, um, and then I wanna tell you a little bit about the process because working in a historic house <laughs> has its own set of unique opportunities and also interesting challenges that you, that I, you know, you don't encounter when you're working with a white box gallery or museum space. And I, really only did work in one other historic house, and that was the Edward Hopper Museum, which was Edward Hopper's childhood home in Nyack, New York. And this had uh, was way more complicated, <laughs> but it was a good challenge. Um, so I just wanted to show you a little bit of the process. When I initially, so there were many, many site visits involved in creating the work. You can see here, I put up some acetate and I traced patterns. Once I picked out the locations and decided what pieces I was gonna be creating, I traced onto acetate patterns and spaces and took lots of measurements. So you can just see some drawing here. This is from the piece, the archway in the hallway, in the entranceway. I kind of love them as drawings too. They were really beautiful. Um, so after I created the drawings on the acetate, then back in the studio, you know, obviously I built the pieces. Um, these are backed, a lot of these are backed either with wood or with, with a thin plywood. Some of them have a gator board. What became really challenging is the weight of these pieces. Surprisingly, erasers are extremely heavy. Uh, the work is anywhere from 30 to 
The wings are about uh, 65 pounds. So trying to figure out how to suspend and install these pieces without any hardware, because it's a historic house, uh, became a very interesting challenge for me. Um, so here you can see after I drew the templates and the acetate, now I'm transferring them. Then they get drawn again in my studio onto tracing paper with pencil. Then it's transferred. So I'm drawing on one side of the tracing paper, flipping it over, tracing it again onto the erasers to transfer the patterns, and then carving all of the patterns. Um, this particular piece, I almost gave up on, to be honest, because um, in addition to uh, the challenges of not being able to touch the wall and suspending things without hardware. This is such an old house and the foundation has shifted so much that between the top and the bottom on this one wall where the piece goes, there's a one inch gap. There's a one inch difference with the shifting of the foundation. So I had to build my pieces at right angles to be structurally sound but then they also had to magically fit into these spaces that were not at all at right angles. So it was a very interesting challenge. And uh, it was exciting when it finally worked out. And here you can see part of the process was I went on site, I think three, three or four times actually for this one piece to really fit it in place. And I made a template out of Gator. So this one, it doesn't have any hardware. And it actually is just cut to fit the arched, the curve, because this is a, you know, a structural beam in the house. And so it rests on both the arch and then there's a little lip on the molding. So it literally gets wedged in place. But the wall on the right, where you see the little piece of the foam, that's the wall from top to bottom. That is an inch, an inch difference which you can very visibly see. <laughs> and then, you know, the patterns had to magically align. So this, this definitely uh, was a technically challenging piece to put together, but it was, you know, really exciting and satisfying when it, when it did finally come together. And this was just one other site visit where I had built the piece in the studio and before I installed doing a final test fitting to make sure it was gonna work and fit in place. But I would say that was, uh, that one piece was probably the most technically complicated, even though it doesn't look like it would be complicated at all. <laughs> so um, yeah, I think that actually is the last slide of my presentation. So I think we can turn it over to Presley and Catherine I'm going to stop sharing, Catherine, so we can have a sure. conversation. Sure, that's okay. fine. That's fine. Um, okay. Well, thank you, Tracy. It was really uh, it's helpful for me even to hear you talk about the work again and talk a little bit more about some of those details, um, even though I saw things happening. And I certainly know that there's no right angle in the house. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but it, it was such a fun an exciting challenge mm -hmm. um, that it actually was really good. And I, I really feel like every time I do a new show and every time I work on something, I constantly learn as an artist, particularly working with unconventional materials. There's always something to learn um, with unconventional materials. <laughs> right, right. Well, we were inspired, um, as you know, uh, the staff was inspired to think about the stories that we have told and how they change. Um, and <clears throat> it's really illustrated by the wallpaper that we have had in the house over many different years. There, there's, we have uncovered different wallpapers and, and paint chips. And uh, there have been many different times where the house was interpreted by you know, a different group of people. And it's always based on that historic moment in which they are interpreting. Um, and we all think that we get it right. 
you know, in our moment, we think, okay, we've got it right. We got the right story. Um, and then 20 years down the line, somebody else says, that's not the right story. They uncover more information. They discover that, you know, that primary source that we thought was absolutely, you know, the, the, the primary, you know, document that was telling the real story is, is not, you know, it's not the right story. Um, so we have created, in addition to what Tracy um, has put into the house, we've also added in a smaller gallery, uh, some fragments of the wallpaper that we have uncovered. And it, it shows you that evolution of thinking about what the story is. Um, and we, we are on this road to uncovering the stories of those who were enslaved, uh, those who might've been indentured servants. And then a little later after that, uh, servants who were uh, people who might have been free, but still they were the servants taking care of the house. We often in historic house museums focus exclusively on the people in the gold frames. Um, and uh, we are on a different journey uh, at the Morris Jamel house than we have been before uh, to try to uncover some of these stories that we never ever knew. Um, so it's been, I, I think that this is where museums in general are going. The recognition is there. It is absolutely, you know, that moment in time where we are right now in 2022, uh, where we are, we are not satisfied with stories that we have always told maybe, you know, um, and that critical look is is really important. Yeah, and you know, I think that's really what it is. It's questioning whose side of the story are we telling. We know so many, so many things have been left out. So I think it's, you know, really exciting and important work that you're doing. And I'm glad that this exhibition could help in some way to spark conversation and research and dialogue or just bring more attention to what you're trying to do. Um, yeah by you know uncovering other stories well we certainly we we want to get that conversation uh happening with people and um speaking of conversation uh presley do we have a question uh or a comment from our audience we sure do so john just put a question in the q a for us that says can you tell us more about eliza jumel what in particular did she tend to be not so honest about in her oral histories? Oh, oh that might be a cat. That's a Catherine question. <laughs> <laughs> you well, would know much better. <laughs> I think um, Eliza, Eliza Jamel and her story uh, is really interesting in this context because she created her story. She was born in poverty in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, she may or may not have, you know, um, lived in a brothel. We don't know. Uh, there's there's evidence uh, of of there's evidence of a lot of difficulty in her childhood, and she grows up, changes her name, moves to New York, becomes an actress, and. Um, and reinvents herself through her marriage to Stephen Jamel, who was a French merchant. Um, and he was doing, you know, import exporting. Um, and he had a lot of money. Um, through that marriage, Eliza also became very wealthy and, um, but also found that she was very good with money. She was, uh, really exceptionally good with her husband's money. She uh, did a lot of real estate um, uh, at business and she was um, she was quite a businesswoman in her own right. Um, so that was sort of, again, reinventing herself. That was certainly not something that women did uh, in general. 
Um, she also wanted to be accepted in New York society. And that was really um, because she didn't have the, the, um, the old money uh, of the Gilded Age. She didn't have the family to look at um, and you know, prove her worth. Um, and, and so she was rejected uh, throughout most of her adult life. Um, she was accepted much more in French society. Um, so that is where she was able to, you know, uh, be in the, the presence of Napoleon. Um, but she is, uh, I think, really, uh, she embodies some of what you're talking about in your exhibit, Tracy. Um, she's erasing some pieces of herself and sort of putting into relief different ideas, putting into the foreground certain things. And um, I, I think uh, we, we don't know the whole story of Eliza Jamel. Uh, we may never know the entire story, but we keep digging. We keep finding new letters, uh, at, you know, they come up at auction and we can, you know, buy those and find out more. Uh, and, and for many years, the DAR that ran the Morris Jamel mansion didn't talk about Eliza at all yeah. because hers was not a story that the ladies of the DAR wanted to tell. Right. So, you know, and, that's, a, that's a big one. <laughs> and just thinking about, you know, these power imbalances, right? I mean, a lot of my work deals with these uh, identity and power and social political issues. I mean, women had no presence uh, it, or very little presence. They were left out of, you know, so many things are still left out of museums in general, but we, we know just as a woman, Eliza, she had very little power at the time. So in some way, um, it was almost like she she was she was gaining her power with this ability to you know she was she was in these circles with Napoleon she was you know like you said managing money and uh, she was sort of coming into her own identity maybe and maybe this was a way for her to sort of figure out her own identity too. Presley, do we have another question? Oh, oh you're yeah. muted right now. Sorry, we have a question from Lori. Um, it says, Tracy, what's your next project or your new site themes or materials? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> Hi, Lori. <laughs> uh, you know, I am working on a show for 2023 at a gallery in Connecticut, but I, I actually am not sure yet. I feel like I've been working on this one project for two years. I've been so immersed in it. It will definitely not involve eracers. <laughs> <laughs> I've had my fill of erasers and soap, but I do feel like part of our, part of my role as an artist, I really see myself as, you know, questioning the world around us, right? I feel like that's part of our purpose as an artist to create problems to solve, to question, thing, question things that we see. And I do a lot of writing in my sketchbook, which is how, you know, the soap piece developed from an investigation of language. And I do a lot of writing. I do a lot of observations about daily life. So Lori, I'm not sure. I'm actually experimenting with some new things in the studio right now that you know, I'm going to keep under wraps for a little while, but I do have a, an exhibition I'm working on for 2023 uh, and we'll, we'll see where it goes, but there's no erasers. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, do we have another question? Uh, let's see if we have a question here that says, Tracy, I'm curious how you were able to work with the erasers as a material. Did you create a large blank surface area to work with? And how did you etch the patterns onto the erasers? I know you talked a little bit about that in your presentation. Yeah, so they, they're, they're all the individual erasers that were either glued to a gator board or a plywood background. 
And then I, I really used like printmaking tools, lithograph carving tools. And so the, the patterns were created on site, drawn on acetate. Then in the studio, they were transferred to tracing paper. Then they were drawn. So all the erasers were glued down first, uh, you know, onto the, the size of the pieces. And then the, the patterns were drawn and then they were all carved, uh, carved in slightly different ways. I will say carving was so fun and such a meditative process for me. I loved just going into the studio and I could just carve for hours. And they were very, very labor intensive pieces. I mean, it took months and months to make an individual piece. I think those wings, I worked on on and off for almost a year just to make the wings, I think. Because you always think, oh, it's not gonna take as long as I, you know, I made the whole production timeline. There was so much involved in this exhibition. And I think I estimated six months, but I probably took a year making those wings. So, but that's a bit of the process. But as I said, I wanted them to be the individual pieces. I, I at one point I actually toyed with the idea of casting a research material. And so I did these experiments where uh, instead of sanding, I, well, I was using rasps, I was using the materials to carve, but then I sort of ground, made a very fine powder from the erasers and I mixed it together with different adhesives. I made a rubber mold of an object just as a test. And then I took the eraser shavings, the powder and the different adhesives and I pressed them into the mold and I, I essentially cast the eraser powder. And I toyed around with that idea for a little while, but uh, I felt it, it lost some meaning and some significance to cast it. I also thought, you know, having like, for example, those wings, if I were to cast those wings, and so it was this perfect version of those wings, I thought that actually lost something. I, I really liked the translation, the, the hand carving. I liked the labor intensive nature of it, but also there's something, it speaks a lot more of history when you have the action, the actual physical action of carving it, of actually removing it. I, I even saved all of the bits that came out, the shavings that came out from, from carving all of these pieces. And that made a lot more sense with the concept to me. Which we have out in the exhibit so people can yes. touch them. Yes, they're very fun to touch. They look a little bit like pink spaghetti. Yeah. <laughs> Presley, do we have another question or comment? Well, we have a related question from Matt who says, silly question, but how are your hands holding up after all that carving? <laughs> You know, amazingly, my hands are fine. I, I will say years ago, uh, I did a project that was a whole environment made out of sandpaper, the rub me the wrong way project that you mentioned. And that was 4,000 pieces of sandpaper. And it was a whole domestic environment that had wallpaper patterns and molding and tile. And it was really, really labor intensive. And I never wanted to see a piece of sandpaper again because that was really torturous, cutting the sandpaper. <laughs> but erasers are surprisingly fun to carve and no problems. So Spencer here um, says, it's not a question, but something that occurred to me about the installation. It's poetic that it's wallpaper because something being just part of the wallpaper um, means it's not consciously acknowledged. and. I'll sort of add on to say that's also, um, you know, the compliment to your installation, Tracy, that um, Meg put together, who uh, assembled the, uh, uh, you know, exhibit that complements Tracy's work, where you have bits of the wallpaper, as Catherine mentioned, on display that have been found uh, during different restoration projects uh, throughout uh you know the years 
uh, and, you know, thinking about this sort of peeling back layers of history and peeling back layers of the wallpaper and how when we peel back these layers of history, we sort of get a more complete image of it. Yeah, totally. Um, and Spencer, I love that idea of thinking about um, the wallpaper as sort of, um, you know, blending into the scenes or behind the scenes. You think about like a wallflower or, or wallpaper behind the scenes. So it's sort of these um, overlooked facts or details in a way, maybe if you think about wallpaper. So that's an interesting um, observation, Spencer. I like that. I think something that, uh, you know, people don't generally realize about a historic house is that it has layers of history. It's not just one moment in time. Uh, it, you know, you have to, as the curators and the um, exhibition designers, you have to decide what is it that we're going to show here. You have to make choices. You can't show everything. You know, it can't be every year that the house existed, that people lived in it. Um, and I think uh, even now it's changing. We continue to add layers of history to the house. And uh, it is, um, it's always based on the moment in time that you're in. Uh, so the house has been reinterpreted over the last five years and it's completely different than it was. So 10 years ago, if you came to the Morris Jamel mansion, it wouldn't have looked anything like it does today, That's which really is really interesting. Yeah, well, and I think too, thinking about this project on a more universal level, right? Like it's, it's you can say this about everything, our, our own personal histories, um, history in general, you think about being in school and the history that is taught to you as a child. Um, the victors write the history books, but now there's new books, there's new stories, there's things that are changing, there are, uh, like I said, on, you know, on a personal level, on a universal level, it's just a concept that translates across the board that you're, we're really, you know, talking about a specific moment in time. And I think that's what's interesting about erasers, right? They're used to erase mistakes or just to remove the information and then something new replaces it. You know, so just thinking about all of these, all of these ways that information is translated, is changed um, over time and in, in the present. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Presley, is there uh, another question? Yes, that's a good segue into um, the next question. Well, I'll, I'll combine two uh, questions that we recently got. So um, Tracy, can you tell us more about how you got interested in the topic of how history gets erased retold and written by the winners? And did you consider using other materials besides racers? And if so, why did you discard those ideas? You know, it's interesting because sometimes, well, okay, I'm going to answer this question. <laughs> I'll get to it. It's kind of a roundabout answer, but I work in two different ways. Sometimes I do a lot of writing. And as I said, I, I observe different things, uh, different problems in society, different daily observations. Sometimes I'm really attracted to a material and I love to play with materials and the different associations that materials have. And I would say I've been thinking about erasers for at least five years now. And I have played with them in my studio and I couldn't quite put my finger on what I wanted to do with them. Uh, and so the idea kind of sat there and I did little experiments and I wrote about them and then I put them away and then I took them out. And I think, you know, it's interesting personally during the pandemic, during, um, you know, just so much, honestly, what I think what initially sparked this idea about history and about identity, um, I think just watching everything unfold um, with 
Black Lives Matter with so many um, acts against, uh, you know, persons of, you know, people of color. And just personally, my, you know, my daughter is mixed race and thinking about, uh, she's part African and, you know, part white. And just thinking about the way that we are treated differently within society. I mean, that's certainly where uh, the SOAP project came from, but also just thinking about in terms of history and what side of the story is being told. I think it came from a personal place of just observing what's happening and why, you know, my own daughter and I, there's different, we're, we're treated differently. And there are different, um, you know, just, just questioning what, what, what she's being taught in school or what things are being questioned. I, I'm also an arts educator and I teach in the public school. So, you know, just sort of looking at the big picture, I think on a personal level is what sort of sparked this idea. And then something clicked and I was like, oh, the erasers really talk about the, this missing information. It really talks about, um, you know, what has been left out of history or what stories are being told. And I think it really came from just uh, personal experiences in my own family and just sort of thinking about the big the big picture and my own identity and the identity of my daughter and um, just sort of questioning what was going on, um, you know, in the time. Great. I, I yeah, I, I think uh, it really does come, it brings a lot of those threads together. Um, and I, I am sure that, you know, the museum wouldn't have been interested or ready um, at another time to have that critical look. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is now, you know, um, with all that has happened. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's a good time for change, right? It's a good time mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. for positive change, right? Yep, yes. Uh, anything else, Presley? Yes. So that's a good segue into um, another. I'm going to again combine two somewhat related okay. questions, yeah. and then um, and then I'll do one more question after that, if that works. Sure. So, um, how do you see this installation uh, as becoming part of the house's history going forward? And as museum educators, how do you find a balance between preserving the legacy of Morris Jumel? mansion and critically interrogating that legacy yeah i think that's a catherine question yeah that uh, <laughs> um <laughs> can you say it again presley because i i need just to hear how the question is sure phrased so how do you see this installation as becoming part of the house's history going forward and as museum educators how do you find a balance between preserving the legacy of Morris Jamal Mansion and critically interrogating that legacy. Okay. I think I think that there is no way to separate out the legacy and the interrogation. Those two things are part of the same process. You you can't interrogate anything unless you have a legacy, you know, you're, you're looking at whatever that legacy is. And uh, so, so there is not, um, there is not necessarily uh, a story that we feel is, you know, synchrostat and we can't touch it or move it or change it. Um, even you know, the fact that George Washington used it as his headquarters, um, yes, he did use it as his headquarters, um, but we are able to interrogate that too um, and, and think about what that meant, think about uh, what happened during the revolution, what the relationships were, uh, between all the people involved. And again, we continue to find out more information. Um, and, and that is, 
the thing about history is that uh, it's not that we're changing history, we're uncovering more. We're just getting a broader, better picture as we continue. It's not uh, that we're changing history, it's really that we're uncovering more of the story and telling a broader or a deeper tale. Um, so I think that those two things are really um, one in the same. And um, the idea of how Tracy's uh, work can sort of continue to resonate um, it's an interesting one because uh, certainly, you know, in our minds as the people working there all the time, we'll, we'll never look at the golden crest, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the wings uh, in quite the same way, you know, um, because we know what it is right now and we might replace the you know, sculpture that you've created, Tracy, uh, back with the gold crest. But um, I think, uh, you know, it will still stay in, in our minds. And I think um, it is, it, it'll be a challenge for us to try to incorporate that uh, into our history, into our new tale that we tell, um, you know, we, we can, th there are different ways that we might be able to do that. Um, so uh, I think that would be, that would be a really interesting challenge to try to figure out um, how to uh, capture some of that, um, you know, the soap in the basement tour. But certainly the smell of the soap is going to stay in the basement far longer than the soap. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least it's soap. <laughs> yes, yeah. It's not an unpleasant it's, smell. It's very <laughs> fragrant sometimes. It's really interesting how uh, it, you know, we, I, I think that that is another part to the exhibit is that uh, you're, you're playing with, you know, you've created something that uh, is visual uh, and 3D, but also just really, you know, gets your senses, so. Right, well, and I think it also goes with this idea of, you know, clean and pure, um, the, the smell of, of the soap. Uh, so, it, yeah, it connects together. Yeah. I have done some other some other work before that was that was scratch and sniff. So I've thought a lot about the connection between between memory and scent. We have a very strong visceral experience with memory and smells. So I think uh, the soap, you know, using these everyday materials, what attracts me to them, I think it really draws people in. So even though I'm talking about serious topics, I'm using these kind of funny materials and it, it invites people, I think, to come in and to investigate it further because the work really functions on different levels. You know, it might just be exciting. You're like, oh, it's bars of ivory soap and it's put together into a cinder block in a way that I haven't anticipated seeing this before. And so it, it, I feel like it works on multiple levels in a way, you're not beating someone over the head with really serious topics. I think it's 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 a way to make the work accessible, more accessible and familiar, and then it has a twist to it. And so it becomes a way to invite conversation with someone that might not normally uh, engage with art in that way, because it's something that they can relate to and something they have a context for already and a history with in their own way. So open mm -hmm. resource. Everyone has an experience with these materials. And I'll finish up with this um, one last question that's in the chat. So Tracy, is there something from your experience working on this project that you think will affect your art practice going forward? 
Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> um, hmm. I will definitely say I've, I've learned a lot working in a historic site, and I did mention a little bit about that, but I might, yeah, I, I feel like part of what's exciting for me using different materials is the challenge of figuring out how to work with them. Uh, so I think, you know, I will continue to work with everyday materials, but there are certain challenges with, so for example, I don't know if I will, <laughs> if I will continue with soap unless it's with the same idea in a, you know, I, this is actually hopefully going to be, you know, utilized. I, I like the idea of using these cinder blocks again in, in other, in other ways to have, uh, you know, to talk about this work, to talk about these systemic structures again, but it's also a very tricky material to use and it had a lot of challenges with it. And it's also a temporary material. So I guess I've been thinking more and more about these unconventional materials and longevity, you know, erasers at least will last over time. It's the work that I create is very site specific to the Morris Jamel mansion, but the erasers, you know, they, they'll still last. The soap, however, is very temporary. And I have done some things that are temporary before, but I guess I'll be thinking more about, uh, you know, the nature of the materials. In, in this case, it makes sense to be temporary, but I don't always want work that's, that's temporary either. So was that the last question, Presley? And we have come to 8.03. So um, we wanna thank you so much, Tracy, for sharing your art, uh, sharing your ideas, and really expanding our thinking about what's happened at the Morris Jamel Mansion. So it's well, thank it's you been, so much. We appreciate it, um, and and we love talking with visitors right now about the exhibit, and you know, just asking questions about their responses. And uh, you often hear. Uh, with the soap, uh, people have to be of a certain age, of course, um, to really identify the old advertising campaign of ivory soap. Um, but you you hear that recognition uh, in people's responses as they stand there and realize what it is, you know, because it's a dawning. Yes. Um, and that's another fun part to the exhibit is that people don't know exactly where the pieces are and they, you know, so they encounter them, they discover them through the house. Um, and I think that's another fun part to the exhibit um, is that it's not all in one place. So yeah. I think, I think that act of discovery is important for the visitor. Um, yeah. And in a way it's important to the concept too, right? The mm -hmm. act of discovery because so much about history and what you're doing is discovering new right. information. So exactly. Well, we want to thank everyone who has joined us for this webinar. Um, and especially Tracy and also Presley for managing us technically. Um, and do come onto our website at the morrisjamel.org site um, and check out other programming that we are doing. Um, if you haven't seen the exhibit, please do come and check it out. Uh, we're open Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday afternoon. So uh, go on our website and look at our hours. You can get tickets online, um, but you can also just walk up and uh, buy your ticket at the door. So uh, thank you all very much. And if we don't have anything else uh, question-wise, Presley, I think we can we can say good night. And I will just say thank you everyone for joining tonight and especially um, Catherine and the Morris Jamal Mansion for this opportunity. It's been uh, really wonderful being able to put this exhibition together. So thank you. You're very welcome. Good night, everybody. Bye.